I, I think I'll uh, move quickly into the image-guided ablation therapy, which is only one component of image-guided oncointervention, the other component being catheter-directed therapy where we're using the vascular highway as access to a variety of organs, predominantly the liver. So this is one area that ablation therapy that has become popularized um, over the last five to ten years and actually incorporates a whole host of technologies. So very early on, ablation therapy was performed using chemical ablation. Uh, and it's still actually very commonly used in Asia. One of the reasons is, is that it's very inexpensive. It only requires a 21 or 22 gauge needle and some absolute ethanol or full strength alcohol. And because it's so inexpensive, clearly it's not sexy enough for America and America obviously <laughs> prefers high tech items that cost a lot of money. But and there are some circumstances that we still use chemical ablation, that is the alcohol and some acetic acid, 50% acetic acid. But most of the ablation now in America is thermal based, whether it's hot or cold, predominantly hot. Now for the hot type of thermal ablation, radio frequency ablation was the first type of technology and still the most commonly used. There are more machines out there. Uh, more recently approved is using microwave technology. Guess what? That requires an additional piece of equipment that's expensive and new probes, etc. cetera. Uh, laser is not used very often. It's uh, more commonly used in Europe, hasn't really made its way over to America, no big advantage. Now, one area that's very, very new is using high-intensity focused ultrasound, or HIFU. It, there actually is a unit that's an Israeli company, uh, Insight, that has a, it's attached to a GE magnet, only a GE magnet, so it's very, very proprietary, and it just and it has received FDA approval in the America for the treatment of uterine fibroids. So not quite malignant cancer, but but a, a, neopl a neoplasm. Um, having said that, that was their way of getting units into the United States. And not many, again, because you have to not only buy the technology from Israel, but you have to buy a, an MR unit. So these are re really not inexpensive. Um, but there are several studies using HIFU now for brain METs and primary brain tumors and prostate work. So I, I think we'll hear more about HIFU or high intensity focused, focused ultrasound in the years to come. So in addition to the hot, so excessive heat will kill cells. Well, guess what? Excessive cold will kill cells as well. And, and cryotherapy actually has been around for many years. The earlier uh, procedures were done in the operating room, usually by hepatobiliary surgeons, where the probes were as thick as your thumb. So you couldn't put those through the skin safely, and they would freeze tumors and portions of liver. Uh, now we have probes that are a little bit smaller. Uh, and can be done percutaneously. So if we're fo focusing on RFA, radio frequency ablation, or microwave, so what's, what's the difference? They kind of sound the same. Well, they're, they're basically technologies uh, in different uh, portions of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So to give you an idea of where we are is that uh, your alternating current at home is usually at 60 hertz. Now there are new TVs, I don't own any, but new TVs that are at 120 hertz now, the new flat panel TVs. Audible sound, you're up to 20 to 20,000 hertz. Now RF, which is the, uh, the technology in RFA, is at the 30 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, so a little higher frequencies than audible work. Even the ultrasound, the diagnostic ultrasound we used on every day is even higher frequency with 1 million to 20 million hertz. But microwave, the really small waves high, high, high frequency are orders of magnitude higher frequency than RF at 1,000 megahertz to 3,000 megahertz. Because of that, uh, that there are different ways of generating heat. So with RF at that low to moderate range of frequency levels, you, it, it actually is a current passing through the patient. So the probe itself is one pole, and you have to have a different area attached to the patient. We usually have a grounding pad on the thigh, so there is actually a circuit, an electrical circuit. So this radio frequency energy is passed through the tissue, through the alternating coil, the molecules rotate, rotate, they create friction, create heat, and that's how you get the tumorcidal heat from the RFA. Now with microwave, 
we're using slightly larger 14 gauge antenna. They're not electrodes, they're antenna. They do not require a complete circuit. The, they, they create heat by dielectric hysteresis. Their, their frequencies right, were much, much higher. So they're rotating very, very quickly. And a lot of the heat and energy is deposited into the tissue uh, through heat. So heat is generated with microwave about 100 times greater and faster than RF. So that means there may be some potential advantages to microwave technology that we're evaluating. Now, just like tr any other true academic medical center, we don't choose between RF and microwave. Guess what? We have both, all right? And, and actually, we have cryo. We have two cryo type of units as well. So we're using both. But I, I sense we are migrating, at least in my practice, we are migrating a little bit towards microwave technology. Uh, one of the limitations in RF, as, as well as microwave, is the tissue desiccation that occurs when you really burn something very quickly, like I often do on the grill. You can char the, you can char the tissue. Charred tissue doesn't conduct the heat. So once you char the tissue, you can't expand your kill zones. That's an issue with RF, and, there were, and therefore we are limited to some size. We have probably less of that with, with uh, microwave technology. And because of the more rapid uh, heating that occurs, we don't think we have as much a problem with heat sink loss when we do RF adjacent to vessels. So the vessels, when you're using ablation, act as your radiator in your car, so the blood flow itself can uh, uh, dissipate the heat with, uh, if there's a lesion adjacent to a big blood vessel. And therefore, we have great limitations with thermal ablation when these lesions are next to big vessels. That, that appears to be less of a problem. Still there, but less of a problem with microwave. So the area that we have most experience, obviously, is with colorectal metastases. Uh, because the liver is a forgiving organ uh, uh, patients, we are at great liberty in many patients with uh, colorectal mets because the underlying liver is very, very healthy. So for years that we've been studying this and we have uh, identified the inclusion criteria typically are those patients that have liver dominant mets or liver only met metastatic lesions. The largest is usually five centimeters, uh, and that actually is on the big side. And usually they're between four or five at most. I mean, we would never attack a patient who has five lesions, all of which are at five centimeters. And clearly, they should not have extrahepatic disease. And that's been a standard type of inclusion criteria for much of the RFA for colorectal mets. So this is a representative example. You can see a, this was a solitary lesion, the dome, that's an MR scan in a 64-year-old uh, uh, patient. So this was targeted, and that's one of the, this is what the RFA, one of the RFA probes looks like. So it's targeted with, in this case, a combination of ultrasound and CT guidance. So this patient's actually on a CT table uh, with an ultrasound machine adjacent to it. The probe is there, and it's connect up, but, but it, can, it can be guided in. And using the CT, you can see that this was obliquely entered, and you can see the lesion is right there. So we're, we're about in the center of the lesion. And you want to have a kill zone that's at least a centimeter in diameter, at least a centimeter in diameter greater than the diameter of the lesion. You need to have that surgical margin or ablation margin to do. So this is a four-month uh, post-ablation uh, uh, MR, and you can see that the ablation site is clearly over a centimeter greater in diameter. So we, we feel pretty good about this. Also, with enhancement, there's no enhancement material, so we pre feel pretty good that we don't have any residual disease at this time. So that's a traditional or typical example of an ablation. So for colorectal mets, this is a kind of a recent study from Europe to show uh, in a patient of only 100, a series of only 100 patients, and that's one of the limitations that we have. Most of the studies that we have with RF ablation are single site, uh, and therefore you can only uh, accrue so many patients. That's why we can really benefit from a large multi-institutional sites where we can get not 100 patients, but 1,000 patients to follow. But this is what they had for their survivals, which are competitive, I mean, which are, uh, so these are patients that, many of these patients are also getting or have gotten systemic chemotherapy as well, but they have liver dominant diseases. We still have an issue with local recurrences with respect to size. So if the lesion is less than three centimeters, the recurrence rates are usually less than 10%. But look what happens when they get up to three to five, the local recurrence goes to 20%, and then greater than five, 
it goes up to 40%. That's because we can't ablate. Those large lesions cannot be ablated with one ablation. They have to have multiple overlapping ablations, and invariably there are cells that are caught in between the, the, the zones. So uh, lung is, uh, liver is by far the most common. Now there are several other organs that are becoming uh, uh, more commonly uh, thought of as potential RFA or ablation type of, uh, of possibilities of organs. One is the lung. And I'll, I'll, I'll show a case of the lung. The other organs are now, that are now being entertained are kidney, uh, kidney lesions, particularly in those patients that uh, are not surgical candidates or they're multiple bilateral kidney lesions, and then they can't have, obviously, bilateral nephrectomies. So kidney lesions, that is usually being treated with, uh, with cryo. Bone metastases have been shown to be very, very well treated, particularly for structure. You do a bone ablation and then follow that up, that up with a cementoplasty where you inject cement, cyanoacrylate into the area to give some stability, and it's very, great for pain. And the, and the one that's kind of lagging, but we're getting a little more experience at, on it, is lung RFA. And typically it's used for cytoreduction in conjunction with a lot of the other things that we've just talked about, chemotherapy, external bean, brachytherapy, and several cases of focal metastatic disease. And it has been used for simple palliation with respect to patients with chest pain, dyspnea, cough, or hemoptysis secondary to that lesion. So here's an example here is a 63-year-old. This was a patient that happened to have a colorectal metastasis, already had a previous metastectomy uh, of another right upper lobe lesion, now with a new two centimeter lesion. And again, this was targeted with, um, with CT. This is the probe going into the lesion. Again, focal ablation. The ablation times take about 15 to 20 minutes or so. Overlapping ablations were used. And this is what it looks like immediately. You have a lot of hemorrhage, surrounding hemorrhage, and it looks like a mess. It does look like a mess. But with follow-up, and after the inflammation and hemorrhage resolves, they start actually shrinking in size. And one of the critical things is to perform contrast enhancement to be sure there's no residual contrast enhancement, which, if present, would have indicated residual disease. And they continue to shrink. That's a six-month follow-up for this patient. 